topic. And this topic is how do I balance work and life? And this comes from somebody who's also working a, a full-time job. So I can appreciate this topic. Um, if you go about a, back about a month, I think we had a conversation about our calendars. We were talking about lead generation, I think, and how it starts with your calendar, right? Um, it's really important. There's seven days in a week. In my eyes, it's really important that we leave one of those days for rest. If God did it, I think we all should probably. Um, it's going to allow you to rehab, revitalize, and refresh so that you're ready the other six days of the week. So my number one tip is always to start out your planning for the week, planning out what, what that day is going to be for you. If it's a Wednesday, cool. Just do lead gen on Saturday then. If it's going to be a Sunday, okay, great. But start your weekly calendar by planning out what your day of rest is going to be so that you can maintain energy. Um, some, day, some weeks you may find that you're just getting burnt out even with a day of rest and maybe you need to take a little extra time. Don't be afraid to take care of yourself first. Then you can get back to it tomorrow. Um, next on the calendar, so if, if first thing you're worrying about is your day of rest, the next thing I normally schedule on my calendar are family commitments. So soccer games or dinner dates with my spouse, time with friends, whatever that looks like. And then the last thing I start to plot out on my calendar is work. So for those of us who are working full-time jobs, it is possible to work a full-time job and still get an ample number of contacts to get our businesses started. We do need to remain a little bit patient. I know it's hard for some of us, but um, this question came from somebody who is relatively young in their real estate licensing career. I think we all are, but, um, and we want it now, right? We want, it, we want success right now. We have to understand though that this is sometimes a, a slow play. Fact of the matter is this person's already got buyers and stuff that they're working with and they should feel really proud about where they're at already um, and continue doing the work that you're doing to get your contacts. You're, you're getting, this person's getting more contacts than people who are on this call who are doing it full time. So a person's working 40 hours a week at another job and still getting more contacts than some of us who are saying we're doing this full time. So the challenge is there, challenge issued, gauntlet dropped. If you're doing this full time, get your hundred contacts. And if you're doing it part time, I think 50 is a pretty reasonable number. What other tips do we have for time management? Does anybody, I, um, Casey, I wanna pick on you. You, you make posts every once in a while. It's, it's called Simple Joy. What's that mean to you? Um, simple Joy for me is there's something, some little aspect of my day that brings me a smile, something that uh, picks me up. Um, but what it is, it's something that sticks in people's head. Um, and I hear it back from people all the time. They all, oh, that's a little simple joy. It just started when I was just taking pictures of sun, uh, sunrise in the morning and I put it on a post and then somebody kept responding back to me about the simple joy. So it's kind of a tagline I've been using. I, I like it. And the reason I asked you to share about that is because it forces you to slow down just for a second. And sometimes that's really critical. Because when you're having a, a rough day or calls aren't going the way you need to or you're, nobody's picking up the phone or you're getting hung up on, it seems like 100% of the calls, sometimes we just need to take a, a two minute break and go find that simple joy. And I think that once you do that, you can find a little reset there. Recalibrating, saying life ain't that bad. I get to do this. I get to sit in my PJs and make phone calls. Or I get to go hang out with friends and make phone calls. It's 
a lot easier than, you know, walking around for eight hours on concrete or trying to, um, you know, uh, swinging a hammer for a living, right? Our jobs are pretty easy. We get to do this. I walk my dog every morning for an hour and I clear my head, but I also plan my day in my head too. So, um, and that way when I get rolling, it's, you know, I'm, I'm usually at a good mind space when I start. I love that. So balancing work and life, it's, if we're being completely truthful, if you, if you hear some of these people on like social media, work-life balance is a myth. I kind of believe that you're never going to have perfect balance. You're always going to have something going on in your life that is that you equate to being work. Even if it's your family, sometimes like taking the kids to and from soccer practice, that is work sometimes. But then being able to enjoy that soccer practice or soccer game when you're there, like means leaving the phone intentionally in the car so that you can just focus on the game. Uh, that, that's another thing I would say as far as like getting more balance or having more time for yourself and recharging your batteries is to leave the device intentionally in another room. Because if you're always tied to your device, you're always gonna be working. And that's tough because in our heads, we're thinking, well, what if I miss a call? Well, they'll leave a voicemail. What if I miss a text? It's a text, you can get back to it in an hour. Take that hour for your kids. Segment off time for dinner. I try to do this from, typically it's from six to seven. Most of you won't hear from me. If you text me between those hours, odds are you're not gonna hear back until seven o'clock. And I've not received too many complaints about that. And if you do complain about it, sorry, my family comes first. And I think we, if we all approach things that way where we, we put priorities above business, the business can wait. I was, uh, I was thinking about this. I have not been in a single situation in my three plus years now in real estate where if I didn't respond immediately, the deal was going to fall through. There's been things that have been time sensitive for sure, but I, I can wait 20 minutes. Hopefully that helps. Um, any other thoughts on time management, work-life balance? All right, um, another question was posed. Should I or should I not respond to negative comments on social media? Any thoughts? The example given was on a next door post. Um, the person raised their hand and said, I'm a realtor if, if you're looking for help because somebody posted, hey, I, I need a realtor, any suggestions? And if you know, the person gets a thousand responses from a thousand different realtors, but it's worth raising our hand for. Lisa will tell you that. Lisa, are you on? She's not. Um, Lisa's gotten a client from doing this, but so the person responded and then heard a lot of negative criticism about realtors in general. So any, any, uh, tips or advice or thoughts on should you respond or should you let it go? Let it go. If you do respond, I would respond in a way that shows your value. Hmm. How, what would that look like in your mind, Chelsea? I love that. Let's go deeper. Um, I guess just like for, I don't know, home values now um i mean i don't know i'm trying to think of you can, can compare maybe doing like a for sale by owner to using a realtor and find stats that show a percentage of you know how much more you can get out of a home using a realtor and maybe stats of people that are more comfortable with buying a home that's with a realtor rather than for sale by owner um and just what you would do for that person to to help get 
exactly what they you know can out of it. Yeah, those are those are really good ideas. Any other thoughts on how we if we were going to respond? So I think you're both right, Chris. You said to let it chill. I think there are certain people that you're just they're just a holes, and you're never going to be able to convert them. Like they're going to be trolls. They're unhappy with their life. And they're just going to naysay or poo poo anything that comes across. But this gives us a, a platform to Chelsea's point to maybe educate the rest of the population that's seeing this post and maybe provide value in a way that the other people aren't. So what other ways can we provide value in that context? Well, when I the post, I always make sure it's, it's, it's a positive, it's a response that if you're going to, if there's a problem that's brought up, I don't pick on the problem. I try and uh, give somewhat of a solution, but in a positive manner. We had an issue with the, in our neighborhood, people kept throwing trash around the recycling bin instead of calling people out because there was addresses on there. I put a, you know, something on there. Hey, as a community, why don't we come together and clean up some of the uh, the park area and stuff. And we did, we got a few people out there um, that actually cleaned up that space. Nice. Josh? Yes. I know that there's been some studies on, on this about should you answer, should you not, and, and what's the, the uh, impact of validity to other people. And what they found is if, if your site has a mix, you know, of good comments and then, you know, a handful of negative comments, but that you address, people find you to be a lot more believable than if you have nothing but good comments because they know that's not realistic and you're probably just pulling down the negative stuff. So it actually helps you to, you know, come across as, as authentic when, you know, somebody complains occasionally and you just answer it in, you know, the best way you can. That's, that's a great thought. And so it provides some validity also if, if, if you're a realtor to defend realtors would show that you are knowledgeable and an expert in the field as well. So you're, you might not win over that one person, but you might win over the 99%. Hey, Josh. Yo. So in my not too distant uh, career past, uh, I was tasked with uh, managing social media responses for the company that I worked for. And, um, and working with, with recruiters and other people that, that would also respond and manage those. And one of the things that I used to tell them is that the internet's forever. So whatever you put out there, prepare for that to always be there. So any response you do have should be measured. It should reflect you and the company that you're representing in a good light. So I always like to tell people, just remember, once you press send, there's no taking it back. I love that. What Megatron just said was, um, uh, Derek, your voice came across really funky there. Oh, lovely. Uh, but what Megatron just said was that, um, the internet is forever. And so whatever you do reply with, make sure it's something you want hanging around forever. I love, that's a great idea too. Um, I'm gonna give you a real life scenario. This is a really timely thing. So yesterday I did a, a stupid, like a, a reel on Instagram and um, basically saying, hey, here's why you should look to buy now versus waiting a year. Cause I get that question a lot. And some troll got on and said, this is the dump, this is the dumbest thing you could tell somebody. We're we're on the verge of a bubble and it's ready to pop. And he didn't really know what he was talking about, but somebody at, on my team asked me, Do you want me to delete that comment? And I said, No. Um, and so I responded to it. I responded kind of like tongue in cheek, um, kind of challenging him to say, like, hey. If you think you're right, you might be, but let's let's play a game. Uh, you go try and buy a house in a in a year, in Hilliard, and I'll try and buy one now, and we can we can compare notes on how much it cost you. And so um, I had a lot of people, a lot of positive feedback from me, like continuing that interaction, and somebody else came in and started talking with that person too. And there's a there's a long dialogue. It's almost annoyingly long, but somebody else jumped in and started to defend the situation as well. And so it didn't all have to come from myself. Um, and to, to your point, Melody, I think it really creates validity to know that, hey, bring your, bring your garbage and we'll, we'll deal with it. Um, 
I've since responded one or two more times and basically said, Hey, I appreciate your, your vigor and your passion on this subject. Um, I think at the end of the day, the facts are the facts and here, what, here's what the facts stay. And, um, I appreciate your comments and, uh, you know, I just want to be respectful to everyone and, and love each person. So, um, I'm hope, hoping that it's ending amicably. Um, but when it first started out, I was a little pissy. I was like, what's this guy talking about? Should I get mad about this? And then to Derek's point, like, I'm glad I didn't go off the handle and say something really mean or stupid because that would have lasted forever. So I love this topic. So there's two options, either be quiet and don't say anything, just know when the right time and place is. There's some conversations you'll never win. Or if you are gonna respond, do it from a, a point of love, of educating and of value. And I think you, you can't lose. Josh, yeah. Um, you know, also like, you know, one of the best strategies to dealing with conflict, you know, I do think that Derek's right. You need to think about what you're putting out there for sure. But whether it's a client sending you an email or somebody online, the faster you respond to them, the faster you can defuse it usually. Because, you know, sometimes when you know there's a conflict or there's bad news, you just want to put it off and put it off. You don't want to talk about it. But the faster you respond to them, sometimes it shocks them that you actually responded and it can help diffuse it. Yeah, I've heard scenarios where people like trolls will say, wow, you, you got back to me quickly. I, although we may not see eye to eye, I, pre I respect you more now. That's a good call out. Any other thoughts about this topic? It's a good one. All right, we are going to move on. This is a good one as well. Um, how do I stay top of mind with a person or a client after we close? I believe was the question. How do I stay top of mind with somebody after we close? One recommendation that that person offered up was like home anniversaries. So besides... Besides home anniversaries, what's another, what's, what are some other ways that we can stay relevant in, in a past client's mind? Holidays. Keep going there. What do you mean by holidays? Um, so in command, since you have the ability to track your contact and things, just make a tag for them, you know, saying that they bought a house from you and then every holiday, send them a postcard. Love that. Does it have to be real estate related, Chris? No, it usually shouldn't be real estate related, honestly. My man. How many holidays are there that we would classify as card holidays? So we got Christmas. What other holidays are there in your eyes? Because these, these touches so if every year we're supposed to get 36 touches with our client with our with our sphere if you were to send out five cards throughout the year that's five of your 36 you only have 31 left so let's talk a lot as a group what other holidays might classify as card holidays anniversary anniversaries are good uh absolutely. valentine's day Home anniversary as well. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, you just said Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Their yeah. kids' graduations are big right now. Mm. Yeah. Congratulating them if that, or if they've also selected what college or what their next step is for them. There are some, there are some cards that need to be handwritten. A kid's graduation one, oh my God, you'd hit a home run with that person if you wrote a handwritten note to that person saying, hey, I just wanted to say congratulations to Johnny on graduating and going to Ohio State. That's not one that you'd obviously mail out and do a mass, mass produced one, but like a Valentine's Day card could be mass produced and sent to your sphere. Mother's Day and Father's Day. Great ones. There are even like the random ones that, you know, every, there's like National Donut Day or National, you know, or there's Earth Day just happened or, um, you know, things like that, that can be really fun 
that even if you just did like your clients in the past month or year or whatever that looks like to you, have them drop off a, you know, dozen donuts or um, a little Starbucks gift card or just something fun for like the national, like silly, like national taco day. All, you know what I mean? Like all the little fun national something day. Those are kind of fun, I think too. And kind of thinking outside of the box a little bit with that. I'll tell you what, D, I bet Deidre, are you on? Yeah, Deidre. Yeah. Yeah. Deidre's here. got these clever little like punchline things that she'll do. She she puts um like popping by. She gives out popcorn uh, things and says, I'm just popping by. I bet Deidre could come up with some sweet um little little puns and stuff. And it'd be really cute to send out and be easy. And you could send those to everybody. I love that idea. Yeah, I just did a um I dropped to all of my past clients that was a um, plastic flower pot. I think I got from Dollar General, a package of um, mint seeds um, and filled it with I don't know, things that I got from the dollar store, candy, hand sanitizer, just things like that. Put a little cellophane wrap and put a business card in there and just said, your business meant a lot to me. And so would your referrals. And just left it on porches and people loved it. <laughs> and I bet I had maybe five bucks in each, well, maybe more than that, maybe $10 in each little flower pot. And so going back to the original question, how do I stay relevant in my, my former client's mind? You're, I'm phrasing the question incorrectly because it's never a former client. It's always a, a past and future client, right? It, because we're establishing relationships with people that are ongoing and that's the whole crux of the question. And so I love the idea of like, as a client appreciation thing, doing something like Deidre just said, like dropping those off on your former clients um, front porches for Christmas. Uh, we always um, traditionally I had me and my wife would make cookies like Christmas type cookies and literally go door to door from the people that have bought or sold with us that year. Uh, fortunately, last year, our business got too big. And we had to pay somebody else to, to uh, make those cookies, but we were still dropping them off. And so that's a great touch. We also dropped off a Christmas card with some um, business cards um, and an, a personalized letter, just kind of like having fun. We do a fun Christmas card. Um, what are, what are some other ways to stay relevant in your clients' minds? I worked with, um, a broker a few years ago that when she would close on a house, she would, you know, obviously her client, she would put, you know, into a system to reach out to them on a regular basis, but she would also put the other person in the system too. So she listed the house the seller would go in and so would the buyer, even though they had worked with a different agent. And what happened was because most agents don't stay in touch with their clients and she stayed in touch with them by the time they went to list again, sometimes they thought that they had actually bought the house from her, not the other agent because they'd completely forgotten who the other agent was. Hmm. So I don't know that all agents would be happy about that, but it, it did work. Yeah, those are called orphan orphan agents or whatever right. that idea. What else? There's a lot of good stuff here. Keep them coming. I know that my, my brother's real estate agent, he lives in a different state, um, but every year they, he holds a, a like bar and food thing for all of his past and future clients. Um, and they really appreciate that. And even though they've owned their house for like 10 years, if they ever sell, they're going to use him because of that. So ev events, conducting events is a, a fun way to stay in touch because you get a chance to invite to, the, to each event. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, because we're talking about this, I want to talk about that for a second. So we are big on events on my team because I, I, I think they can be fun and low hanging fruit on means to reach out to your, your sphere and stay top of mind. Uh, last month we did a, or this month we did a volunteer event, which was totally free. 
Um, I think I spent $100 on food for the people who attended, but it was an easy way to invite and also give back to the community. Not every event has to be you giving your people stuff. In fact, I would say don't do that because then people are only around you to get stuff. And yet we do do fun events like that where we, uh, I actually pair with some vendors and they help us offset the costs on certain things. You can do the same thing, but we have, we've run several times, we've run uh, call-in events where if you call in, you'll be entered in to win. And so we obviously talk about real estate when, we, when they call in. And if you give us a referral, you get extra entries. So everyone's trying to think of their buddy down the street who's interested in buying or selling. And so the last time we did this, we got, I wanna say three referrals. I'm in contract on a new build with one of these people. It's like a $500,000 house and I'm gonna sell their house. Had that, would that have happened without this event? I don't know. But it was a reason to reach out to people multiple times. Events are great. Good, good call out, Leah. What else? Monthly newsletter. So it's just some information on the market. Maybe I think mine I have in there, um, like your monthly to do list for your house to just, you know, like check the gutters type stuff. And then just fun, like, um, maybe local shops or restaurants that you want to shout out to or very informal. Cool. Any other ideas? So the way the way the Red Book, the MREA, Millionaire Real Estate Agent, recommends, back when it was written, I think it was a 32 touch. It's now 36 touch, I think it is. Um, basically, the reason we say 36 touch is because the research states that if you touch a person 36 times over the course of a year, you're going to stay top of mind with them. And so if you do it consistently, so the way MREA uh, says you should do it is at least four calls a year. So that'd be a quarterly phone call just to check in with them, see how they're doing. A series of emails. So in my eyes, 12 emails or like a newsletter to Nicole's point would be a great opportunity. So right then and there, you're up to 16, which is almost halfway there. Other opportunities are at least four face-to-face -face interactions a year. For some, for some clients that may be challenging or for some you might be really good friends already and that's you're gonna slaughter that number. But if you need to be intentional about it, schedule a coffee every quarter, schedule a lunch, go get a beer, whatever your style is. Other app opportunities are postcards or mailers, handwritten letters like we just talked about and events. These are all great ways to stay top of mind in our spheres, uh, minds. And even for those people who are just entering our spheres, so let's say I get a lead today, what would prevent me from inviting them to that event next week? Nothing at all, like do it. Start just acclimating them in with, lumping them in with your VIPs. Why not try it? Can't hurt. <clears throat> All right, we've got five minutes left. I do wanna to get to the last question we had was talking about investments. So the, the way that I took that question was how to find investment properties for investors. Um, so I'm gonna start answering that question. If that's not the right question, then Mr. Jason, you can pop on and, and clarify that. But if you are trying to find, go ahead, Jason. Oh, no, you're good. That's, that's right up my alley. Okay, perfect. So how to find properties for investors? Well, it ain't easy. I like to um, get in good with the, the wholesalers and have the wholesalers send you stuff. And there are plenty of wholesalers out there. Chris, um, you were recently a wholesaler. So you probably get those emails pretty regularly about, um, homes that non-licensed people have gotten into contract on and are basically selling that contract off. And typically you can get into homes for pretty cheap. What wholesalers do is basically gear 
for people who are in financial distress, um, get them in contract on stuff and then sell that contract off. So that's a, that's a means of getting a deal, quote unquote deal on a property. I will say you're not going to find most deals on the MLS. In order to get a deal, you're going to have to find stuff off market. Where do you find wholesalers? Man, I feel like they've just send me random stuff all the time. I didn't even have to go look for them, but you, um, Chris, do you have any good recommendations there? Chris must, Chris dropped off. Sorry. Um, I will look through my list of people that send me stuff and all you need to do is ask to be put on their list. There's three or four that I get multiple emails every week from. Um, and a lot of their stuff's hot garbage, but some of it might be viable. So in order to find things, you're gonna have to look off market. That's where I recommend door knocking or cold, cold calling neighborhoods or um, putting up, they call them uh, bandit signs. So those little signs that you see will buy ugly houses. You see those all over, like go to um, like downtown area. You're gonna see, we buy ugly houses all over the place. You have to be the first point of contact in order to get deals for your investors. I don't love working with investors because they're challenging. They're, they want the numbers to work for them. And you might find something that you think would be viable, but they don't. So it's, it is challenging. I'm not going to lie. Anybody have any other tips or advice for investors? Anyone had success? Would it be worth it to look for uh, for rent by owners. So technically already investment properties, but maybe they're would be willing to get rid of a property. Yeah, that's a really good idea, Chelsea. And you can find those on Zillow or Craigslist. Another good opportunity. So we all, I'm sure you've been following along, like the government keeps postponing the, um, eviction process for people who aren't paying their rents due to COVID stuff, that's going to come to an end soon. So forbearance is coming to an end soon. And what that is going to likely mean is that there's going to be a whole lot of people kicked out of their places. And so a lot of landlords are going to be looking to maybe sell or move on. Um, there's this list that my coach turned me on to. It's called, or a, maybe a website. I haven't played with it yet. It's called Fiverr. F-I-V-V-E-R, it's called Fiverr, F-I-V-V-E-R, that you can go to and get a list of, um, what's it called? Non-occupying homeowners. So basically the, the owner of the, the home doesn't live there, meaning it's likely an investment property. And they were saying something like for $10, they provided a list of all the the non-present homeowners in their city. So it could be an option for us to get some good phone numbers. Just realize what time it is. Um, sorry, I don't, don't have any more time. I hope that this was beneficial for y'all. Thanks for participating. Y'all did a great job and provided some really good information. If you have any other questions or tips or advice, holler at us. Love to hear from you. Thanks, Josh. Thank Thanks. you. Ta-ta. Thank you. Bye.